My job, um, I recently joined the v and um, about five months ago as curator of digital design. What is digital design, you ask? Nobody knows. Um, it's, uh, the, the problem with saying digital design is that digital design touches a lot of things. It's quite hard to define, which is one of the big challenges that I'm doing. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is kind of two things. One is kind of what I do as a job and a particular collection that we look after. And the second is a, a sort of weird obsession of mine that I've had for the last couple of years, um, which is maybe more related to what uh, John was saying about Russian trolls and Samira as well. Um, so the v as you know, it's been going for a long time. 18, this is where I have to remember, 1857, I think we've been going. And we're quite used to, as John said earlier, dealing with like really old stuff and stuff that has like the weight of history behind it. And you know it's important because it's precious and someone said it was in an academic, put a paper about it and that kind of thing. But the problem is we're kind of dealing with this issue where there's a lot of things that are happening in public now and particularly sort of design is not a thing that you put in a glass case anymore, as it's always been. It's been something that we've been living with and is mass produced and mass manufactured. And there's lots of things that people don't necessarily think of as design and particularly museum worthy that um, that we're kind of confronting. And we've and what I'm going to kind of talk to you today is about a particular collection called Rapid Response Collecting. Um, there we go. Um, rapid Response obviously is a term to kind of very quickly responding to something that's usually used in kind of emergency scenarios. Um, and uh, Corinna Gardner and Kieran Long, who were the originators of this collection, decided that we needed to do something about the design objects that were happening now and becoming quite important now. Because usually when you go into a design museum, there's like an Eames chair. Eames are great. They were really important. Um, but the problem is you don't expect to see a pair of Katy Perry eyelashes or architectural spikes. And just to explain these two images, uh, they're particularly important to us because of what they tell us about wider things. So it's not just about the kind of the, the intricacy or the beauty or the object. It's kind of not about the beauty at this point. It's about what they tell us about wider societal issues that design naturally impacts on. So on the left, you have these um, really strange eyelashes from Katy Perry. Um, I mean, if you want to wear them, that's great. Um, but they were sold as being sort of handmade. And they were kind of, the, the difference between that is obviously, yes, they are handmade, but by people in Bangladesh for like 15p a day. And the idea of you being able, like the kind of the concept of artisanal and craft is something that's really particular in design. Um, because you, the idea of something being crafted and hand, like people look at sort of ceramics and go, oh, that's very well glazed. Um, but you don't think about these kind of mass manufacturing issues that come into that conversation. Um, on the right hand side, we have the architectural spikes, which are these horrific objects that were put down by several councils. I'm going to try and remember, I'm not going to attribute it. I thought it was Lambeth, but I don't think it is Lambeth. Um, but these spikes that are put to, uh, particularly in private properties, to stop kind of people from sitting down kind of outside buildings. And actually, it's more to do with people sleeping and rough sleeping and how you want to kind of sanitize an area by designing an object that isn't deliberately trying to be um, sort of, we hate homeless people, but rather like we want to kind of, we want to kind of make sure that they preserve these for posterity. And there's some fantastic work that's been done by people where they've put like mattresses over them, which obviously looks ridiculous. And there was a, it kind of, it's part of that antagonistic architecture um, that like the Camden bench. And if you, anyone knows about the Camden bench, but it's a particular kind of concrete bench that was designed for you to be able to sit on it but you couldn't lie on it or couldn't really get comfortable you have to kind of which is sort of angle your body um, and a pair of goldsmith students made this brilliant table that fit to the dimensions of it and just put it straight on top and went there we go it's a bed um, and uh, but we're really interested in those conversations because it shows how society does impact on those things um, and then on the left hand side you have kind of this story uh, sorry left and right this story of 3d printing and 3D printing is often the thing about sort of hobbyists and it's something that we've been told is brilliant. You can print a house and your cat and whatever you want. But it also has these really weird conversations um, and kind of weird mythologies that come as a result of this. And on the left, you have the... Um, I'm not going to pronounce the full name because it's very technical. These are the, the handlebars that were uh, printed for Bradley Wiggins for his one-hour record. Not one minute because that's insane. Maybe it was one minute. Um, but they were created with his dimensions in mind and they were very carefully sculpted so they worked for him and made him the most aerodynamic. Now the rules and regulations for this particular record is that you have to use something that is mass manufactured that anyone can get hold of and they argued that these 3D printed handlebars, anyone could just get the file and reprint them. So of course it's mass manufacturing and it redefined the idea of 3D printing being this thing so you change that narrative by one particular object. On the right-hand side, you have the Liberator, which is this, again, very strange object, which was the first 3D-printed gun by Cody Wilson in 2013, 14. 
and the whole idea for this was this idea of redefining um, what it meant to have liberation online because the whole point is that the defense distributed the company he started to, to actually investigate and start printing these things wanted to make these objects available to anyone to use because it was like well if they're going to shut it down in this point then there's this point and that we can like grasp this and, and we can get everyone to have guns in their homes and they're kind of crap they shoot like one bullet and that's it but that's kind of not the point the object isn't really the point it's the file the file is the thing that's that we've collected the objects are just a kind of um expression of that they they kind of show you the, the tangible side of it but the file is the thing that's interesting because how do you keep track of a file like if that goes to somewhere else and that goes to some, like to someone else's computer and this is what i mean by kind of all these objects redefining the way we think about design and particularly kind of asking what we think design is i guess i'm bringing this um to the fore through um uh this is the a blown up this is the one we have because um, we've got the original shot one and a print that we did. And the amount of conversations we had to have with the US about export was quite interesting because they viewed this as, a, as an illegal export, even though it was just a file. And there's a lot of issues with figuring out how you see digital objects in museums anyway. Um, but then you have kind of the, these kind of, kind of conversations. So we collected last year the, the pussy hat that was at the Women's March. Um, which we class as a digital design object because it actually came from a digital culture and the idea of storytelling and the idea of um, pulling these objects in means something and, and who gets to be represented and who gets to be in these stories. And I know this is kind of a bit of a departure from the, from the work that uh, John and Samira are doing, but it's, we're trying to figure out what the role of the, kind of the political object is. And you have objects like this and we also have an umbrella from the Hong Kong Day protests, um, which was a couple of years ago, I think it was. Mm. Um, and the idea of pulling in things which tell stories of kind of to show how um, these issues, particularly like the, the pussy hat, which was something which was originally a knitting pattern that was started as part of the Facebook group that then became a million billion strong. Um, that's very fake news that I just said. Sorry, I'm very aware of my verifiable <laughs> information. Um, millions of women took part, like, and it's so significant. And the, like, there's a lot of controversy around the pussy hat itself, obviously, in terms of biological centrism and that kind of thing. But it's like the weird, the fact that it was such an important characteristic and everyone kind of knows and kind of what that meant. Um, but it's, it's trying to figure out kind of what we collect, which is the problem. Because obviously we could collect everything and there are lots of museums who are doing fantastic work trying to pull in loads of things from, from protests. But we have to remember as museum kind of curators and collectors that whatever we bring into the museum will stay there literally forever. Because it's one, it's really hard to get rid of an object in a museum. I didn't know this until I started my training. But you can't just say, oh, we're taking it out now. There's a whole process you have to do. But so you do have to think very conscientiously. And even these objects which seem that they're being very kind of spare of the moment, we do have to collect them. And this is why it was really encouraging to come to the fake news exhibition um, today, because it's, it's encouraging to see that museums are having that very quick response approach, because we are now living in a time, as, as, a, as the previous two speakers kind of mentioned, where like there's so much information known, there's so much to decide what means something and what is important. Um, and that's kind of what we're just starting to understand now at the museum through the rapid response collection. And we're going to kind of taking it in a new direction soon, which I'm looking forward to. Um, also, the direction like we're trying to think about what we can do next with it because we've got this little gallery which is in 74A, which is kind of in the light well. You can see the refugee flag when you walk in. So if you're ever in the VNA, um, and it's it, it's it's important to us to understand that because obviously we have to understand our own history and wait as a like the origins of the museum was this kind of a, a weird tastemaker. So we brought in things that people wouldn't have put in their homes, and this is kind of these things are in people's homes, and that's kind of what we want to close the, the gap on. Uh, the next thing is less professional. Um, and this has had to do an article. I said, because John asked me to speak about a couple of things, and um, I, I kind of wanted to kind of poke at these particular things. This is an article I wrote last year about the Russian embassy Twitter account, these chaps, or chat with chapess. We don't know who, we actually don't know who it is. This is, a, this is one that I'm going to kind of come to. And the reason why it's so interesting is because it's a, a Russian Twitter account, or uh, embassy account, which is of the embassy, it's verified, it's got the blue tick on the right-hand side, um, but it has a very strange character to it. Um, and as someone who looks at this design, archiving and collecting, part of the thing that's always really important for me to understand is the context and the story about it, and particularly kind of the interactions that people have with it. Um, and they, they, they're just really strange. So they, uh, they tweeted like kind of two years ago um, to MOD Russia, this, it's, it's basically trolling. It's, um, it's, it was an image that he took from, um, like, the, the, I've, people have, back, have researched this particular tweet in quite, quite great detail. 
Um, and it's a, I've got it written down, the journalist. Um, it was Carl McDonald who actually realised that this game was from, uh, this image from the game Command and Conquer. And it's the first image that you find when you type in bomb truck on Google search. Um, and so what you had, like, but you don't expect that from an embassy. And this is before Trump started tweeting like about being a political bit or probably in the, in the kind of the, the ramping up, but not as prolifically as he is today. And he just trolls people, or he or they, he trolls like they troll through their um, their social media account. And it's a really interesting way of looking at like international development in action through memes, because they're essentially what they're trying to do is push this weird culture around memes. Um, in the right hand side, you have uh, I think it says image used for illustration purposes only. You see this quite a lot in their images. Um, let's see if I think the next one. So that's the rubbish embassy UK. Whoa, no. That's Russian Embassy UAE. <laughs> but the thing is that like, like, it's kind of horrific about it. These are real events where people are, are being killed. It's like kids playing toy soldier and you kind of have the whole point of a meme and the whole point of using these things is for it to be funny. Like, I know that obviously we're supposed to have a, a bit of a sense of humor about horribly grave things. But like, there's a point where it's like, should they be using toy trucks to talk about these kind of Ukraine invasions, which is already a particularly sensitive event um, conversation already. Um, but there's this, this constant use of them in the embassy, and it's it's what's been fascinating for me about this, um, like not this is kind of before the Russian hacks and the Russian leaks, the idea of using image culture and memes, and um, and again the kind of early sort of fake news before fake news started, but. And there's great reactions from people on, on Twitter. It's like, is it literally a teenager? Which is like, little did they know, maybe it was. I don't know. Uh, sitting in their bedroom. Um, but they, they started kind of like doing this, uh, picking up these particular languages and cultures of the alt-right. So things like the word snowflake, which is being used to kind of describe someone who's particularly sensitive or someone who's particularly... Um, Sort of, I, I know, very like, like as, as Samira said, libtards, like, <laughs> like kind of a liberal person who's like, oh, you, oh, God, you're so soft, that kind of thing. Um, but this is a, a researcher who's saying, like, here's my research being most appropriate by an embassy. And this brilliant, uh, it's kind of, again, it's, you don't want to laugh at it, but it's kind of funny. It was like, there's too much snow in Russia to bother about London snowflakes. And it's, yeah. Um, but then it kind of gets a bit worse because it's like, this is a, a serious kind of outpost of Russia in the UK that is basically engaging in actually quite abusive and terrible meme culture. Does anyone know who that is on the left? Just put your hand up if you know who that is on the left. And I'm not going like, to tell you for being a person. So this is Pepe Le Frog. It was originally a, ca a cartoon called Boys Club by Matt Fury, and it's recently been inducted into the, um, I'm going to remember this, Anti-Defamation League's hate symbol database because it's being used by the alt-right who is sort of that... that weird, twitchy, right, kind of uh, far-right group who uh, operate very, kind of, uh, largely on the internet. Um, they're interesting, there's been some research, actually, it's not, the actual alt-right itself, as a, as a com community, isn't that big, they're just very prolific and they're very good at using bots. Um, and the Russian embassy used Pepe Le Frog, this very known alt-right symbol, to talk about uh, relations with Theresa May. And it's like, what does it mean now for that, that there to be that conversation around engaging with meme culture, and particularly a particular position, uh, political position, to then uh, start to dis disrupt this? But should, again, it's, it, the part that I always kind of think is like, is this something that the Russian embassy should be tweeting about? It is, it's, it's very much like how we, we've now understood that Trump tweets, which is very quickly and very like, sporadically and very like like make you think like very much like mm, like much, like sad that kind of thing and the work again and it happened again on the right hand side where Donald Trump then went to retweet uh, this kind of image of himself that was like Pepe the Frog there's a very clear link that he's like you can kind of draw this very weird um, line around it and it's it's the thing is that the idea of like international diplomacy and and relation action is always fascinating um, and then they started picking up on the fake news debate, obviously, and literally trolling like media and news um, companies, just saying like fake news, this is fake news. Like we're telling you, we are we are the Russian embassy. We're telling you it's this. And like a, a lot of people have asked me, like, have you tried to find out who this person is? And like I'm gonna, I I, I have been trying to find out who this person is. Just uh, at one particular dark evening, I started comparing different images from a, a social media event that they happened to be at in training. Um, but it's again, it's it's the it's what Twitter does to our idea of these kind of larger conversations. Like, obviously, the whole idea, the, the, the kind of good idea with Twitter was that people could talk to each other about different things and, like, you have lots of different opinions and lots of different... Uh, and hopefully it wouldn't all turn into kind of a big Nazi breeding ground, but um, maybe it has a little bit. Um, but the idea of... I don't know, it's trying to figure out... Uh, it's something quite weird that maybe I want to bring to the table a bit. It's like, what role do does something like this have in our understanding of kind of politics now and... 
uh, yeah, I thought I'd just leave you with this. Just, again, just really strange, like UN stockpiles medicines and food founded in Aleppo. Um, do you remember the lives of the last hospital? And like, that, like, this is not something that we should be ignoring. I know it's very easy to laugh it off and be funny, but it says something about, it sets an example, a weird example that I think we should interrogate. Um, so that's, that's my own sort of weird hobby, is following the, uh, the Russian embassy Twitter account. Please don't tweet them and tell them I'm talking about this, because they've tweeted about your exhibition. But uh, yeah, thank you.